Disowned children of Reddit. What's your story? Where are you now? Rounder 8. I was disowned by my mother and her side of the family when I was 12 years old, and my parents were getting divorced. The divorce was a circus. Kidnapping, bribery, court-ordered psych evaluations, conspiracy, and a fake child saw accusation had my dad arrested. The day my mom filed for divorce, her brother came and kidnapped my sister and me from my grandmother's father's side home, forcibly, and took us to his place in the mountains, where we were held for a week, under constant observation, and disallowed access to a phone. They would repeatedly take my sister and I away from each other and sit us down and browbeat us about how awful our dad was and how we needed to stay away from him, couldn't trust him, didn't love us, etc. They did this for a week, until he brought us back to my mom. I didn't see my father again until about two months later. It turns out my mom had had this so well set up that he was given only 15 minutes to take what he could carry and leave our house, without even his car, and got them to file a restraining order that barred him from even going to his own mother's or brother's house, because it was too close to ours. What followed was a five-year divorce process. During that time, I was constantly verbally assaulted by my mother for my refusal to do what they told me to when talking to custody evaluators or other agents of the court. I know my dad, and the stuff they said about him wasn't true. I held firm about this. My mom told the court that I had severe psychological issues after I held to this. As a result, I was forced to begin attending multiple therapy sessions a week with a court-appointed psychologist. She was quite firmly, from the get-go, on my mother's side. She would have sessions where it was just her and my mom sitting in front of me and telling me how wrong I was for an hour straight until I couldn't say anything because I'd be crying too hard and begging them to leave me alone. I showed that psychologist a clear hand and nail imprint my mom left on my back after beating me after I continued to insist I wanted to live with my dad. She chastised me for doing so and refused to acknowledge it. After about a year and a half, I was finally able to live with my dad. The divorce was still going on, and my sister lived with my mom. My sister had become a mouthpiece for whatever she wanted her to tell people when interviewed. She would stay with my dad and me every other weekend. So, my mom and her family couldn't tolerate this, so they came up with a plan. They started forcing my sister to hang out with a neighbor girl my sister did not like. They then got my sister to continually ask if the girl could sleep over at my dad's house. My dad finally said yes. They claimed a week later that my dad saw the girl while she was there. He was immediately arrested. The thing is, I knew for a fact that my dad never left his room after the girls went to sleep. I know because at that time I had severe problems sleeping and was up the entire night. I testified in court about this. The girl changed her story six times in court, then admitted that my mom's family put her up to making the accusation. Immediately after this, my mother and her side of the family disowned me. It's been about 13 years since. I live with my dad still. Things are good. I have a job I enjoy and good friends. And I honestly haven't felt I've missed anything of value from not being around those people. They did ask me to come to my grandfather's funeral this year. And I refused. Prompting them to accuse me of being childish and selfish. I definitely am not missing out on anything. The act of disowning someone is an inherently selfish act. The sort of people who would really do that likely don't really care about you as a person more so what you offer them. And that's certainly not the perspective of actual family. In response to Rounder 8 Breaker Breaker You should sue the psychologist or file a complaint with whatever state board runs their certifications. That person is unfit to evaluate children. I'm totally serious. Sorry, you had to go through all that. Remember, there are way more good people in the world than arseholes. Keep making friends and maintaining those healthy relationships. Rounder 8 I looked into her back in 2010. She was sued twice for doing this or similar things in other cases and came out still able to practice both times. I'm not going to dwell on her. She's not worth it to me. But I am disappointed that she's done this to other people and can't seem to be made to stop. At Heolian. I was disowned when I was in college. My brother who had already been in and out of juvie and jail stole my debit card, charged thousands of dollars worth of adultery to it, and spent every penny I had. The police basically faffed around and said they couldn't do anything until I pressed charges to prove I hadn't given my brother permission, or some such nonsense. And the company wouldn't refund my money without a police report. I told my mom I'd have to file a report in order to get the money refunded. My dad found out and told me I was choosing to punish my brother or my family. I needed the money back to pay for food and tuition. They never offered to help me recoup the money. 
but they were so furious that I tried to file a report to get the money back. I did end up getting the money back and felt like the worst person that had ever lived. Although the police had basically no interest in pursuing anything against my brother. Eventually, many months later, they started talking to me again. But I knew they valued him far more than me. Deleted. My mother remarried when I was seven, to a man who considered me a reminder of her having a life before him. They had three more kids, but I was essentially disowned when I was seven. Unfortunately, I had to keep living with them until I was 18. It was horribly abusive, both physically and mentally and it was totally Cinderella without the hope of a wealthy prince to save me. They kicked me out at 18, gave me $60 in food stamps, told me to figure it out, and then moved to another state. I had no family in the area, and all my friends were leaving for college. I ended up spiraling out of control, getting into drugs, and drinking a lot every day. I got into drug running and sold meth and weed for a large region of my area. I had guns pulled on me, was hiding from police, and was largely homeless. My supplier got me pregnant and, naturally, wasn't a stand-up guy about it. I got myself into a homeless shelter, slowly got back on my feet, and had my son at 19. I put him up for adoption, and he lives with a wonderful family. I found myself in an abusive marriage for a couple of years before finally finding the courage to leave, meaning I was starting my life over again at 21 for the third time. I dated a nice guy, one that didn't ask a lot from me because that's all I could handle. We split up because I wanted to do more with my life and he was happy being where he was. So at 24, I found myself starting over again. I moved to Oregon and dated a guy for nine years. I went back to college and got a degree in finance, and I got hired by a top tech firm right out of college. I'm 31 now. I got involved in dance and met a lot of wonderful friends. That guy and I split up amicably, and we're still friends. Finally, at 34, making close to a six-figure salary, I met a wonderful man who is everything I've always searched for in a partner. I have a terribly successful career, a wonderful partner who is ambitious and brilliant. We have a lovely little home in the city, we travel, we share hobbies, and we have two sweet cats and our baby bunny. Occasionally, I look my family up on Facebook, and they're still in the same state. My siblings are either working dead-end jobs or unemployed, and still living with our parents, and no one in that family seems to have done anything worthwhile. I'd say it turned out well. TLDR. Booted out. Went from a homeless meth dealer to a six-figure salary at a tech firm, and parents still stink. Gcar 37. I feel like I could write a damn novel, but I'll boil it down to the essence. I'm 30 now, and my parents got divorced my sophomore year of college. Things were already a bit tense toward the end of high school, but most of the big stuff happened once I went to college. During the divorce, my dad was made out to be the bad guy, and I believed it. I was 150 miles away from everything happening. All the news I got about the divorce was secondhand for most of the year. And by the time I moved back home, things were very contentious. My mom is very manipulative, and as a kid, I guess I never realized just how bad it was. So I had gone away to school. Money had been set aside. I went to a school out of state because we had this money and a plan to pay for it. My mom accused my dad of spending it all. To this day, I don't know exactly what happened to the money, but suffice to say, I had to live the American dream and take out tons of student loans for a degree I really don't use. I've been paying for eight years, and I'm still 60k in debt. I know this isn't a largely different experience than for many other students, but I really wasn't prepared for it since the money was supposed to have been there. Because I had gone to school out of state, I settled down away from my family. I got married and bought a house, you know, normal things that normal people do. Well, my mom viewed this as me abandoning her and the rest of my family. This wasn't the case but admittedly I dreaded talking to or visiting my family because every conversation just evolved into hours of complaining. My mom about my dad, my dad about my mom, my brother's drug problem, my mom disliking the fact that my sister came out of the closet. It was all really draining. I told them all how I felt about it, and my dad backed off for the most part. My mother took it completely the other way. She refused to call me and stopped returning my calls around May of last year. She also convinced my sister that I hated both of them at that time, not true. And so my sister stopped talking to me as well. My brother is nearly impossible to talk to, as whatever drugs he has been taking have caused mental instability. I went from having two siblings and parents to talk to to two siblings that either can't or won't speak to me, and one parent who moved 3,000 miles away to start fresh. I can't blame my dad on this one. This is all set up. Here's where the story really begins. I haven't spoken to my mom between May 2014 and November. 
my wife finally convinces me to try and reconnect, and foolishly, I agree to do so. It was Thanksgiving, and we were with my in-laws, and she managed to make me think it could possibly be a good idea. I called my mom, and shockingly, she actually answered. She pretended the last six months never happened, which simultaneously angered and confused me. But I tried to go forward nonetheless. One thing my mom mentioned was that my dog wasn't doing so well. He was older, and we had him when I was in high school. I couldn't take him to college, obviously, and no apartment that I lived in would allow him either. By the time I bought my house, we had two cats that are very skittish, and I figured that it would be best not to introduce my dog a black laboxer mix who is very chill, but still. I asked her to keep me updated on what was happening, and I made tentative plans to meet with her and the rest of my family at Christmas. Christmas comes along, and I spent Christmas Day with my in-laws again. I talked to my mom and told her that I would come down to her place the next day about two hours away. She told me that she was okay, and that she had to work until 6 p.m., but she was concerned that my dog wouldn't make it through the night. I hesitated to leave on the spot, but I didn't want to drag my wife away from her family. The next day, I called my mom around noon to confirm that she still had to work and that I would see her around 6. No answer, so I texted a few times to her and my sister over the next two hours. I finally received a response at 4 p.m. I still have the text on my phone because of how badly this devastated me. My mom told me they were at the vet, putting the dog down at that moment. I asked where what the vet was because I was already in town and was most likely less than 30 minutes away. I was told to stop bothering them because I was being a pain. That's right, in trying to see my dog one last time before he died, I was being a pain in the arse. I texted them one last time and never received a response. That was the last time I ever heard from my mom. I did not get to see my dog, as I was shut out on the day he died. What a great Christmas present. My wife and I drove home instead, and it was one of the longest drives of my life. My mom got married about a month ago. I found out from my wife, who found out on Facebook. We were obviously not invited or even notified. I honestly cannot see a scenario in which I ever want to speak to her again. There is way more to the story. And in my haste to write this, I'm sure I left more than a few things out. TLDR. My mother refused to let me see my dog the day after Christmas because he had died. I haven't heard from her since. I guess you could say we disowned each other. Even if technically she did it to me first. G3 is bought. I was disowned by my father's side of the family after they had gotten divorced. It didn't happen all at once. It was actually pretty subtle. First, obviously, my dad left, and he didn't really show up much. He would call up maybe once a month and proclaim that he was going to pick my brother and me up that weekend. Saturday morning would roll around. I'd get my younger brother up, and we would go around the house cleaning, making everything spotless just the way he liked it. We would sit and wait. We didn't even turn on the TV or play video games, because dad was going to be here soon enough, we thought. We would continue to sit there, and he would never show up. I'd fall for it every time, though, without fail. Like I said, though, the entire family disowned us. I used to see my aunt his sister and my uncle all the time. When my parents were still married, they would just show up out of the blue or pick my brother and me up, taking us on trips or camping. Almost every single one of my best childhood memories came from them. After the divorce, though, they stopped showing up. Occasionally they would invite my brother and me over rather than just me. And eventually that came to a halt. They didn't even answer their phone anymore. My grandmother was in the oddest situation, I think. She didn't live in the same state, but she still made a point of calling at least once a week when my parents were married. And she would always want to talk to my brother and me. On Christmas, she would send cards and gifts. And during the summer, she would generally come visit for birthdays. But if she couldn't, she made sure to send us a card with a letter. Immediately after my dad moved out, that never happened again. She didn't answer her phone and never sent a card, a letter, or anything. When you're a kid, you really don't understand what's going on or why these people, who had showered you with so much love, turn their back on you at a moment's notice. They were the closest thing I ever had to that sense of family bound by blood, connected in a way you can't connect with anyone else. My mom's side of the family has always been weird, always keeping family ties at arm's length. You visit during the holidays, and when you do, you force a smile, stay for an hour or two, and leave. That's it. Pink walrus. My father disowned me, but it was never an official thing. I was in an unwanted pregnancy, and my sister, when she was born, was given up for adoption. My mother committed self-harm when I was 18 years old and a senior in high school, and my father pretty much told me that he didn't have to deal with me anymore. 
so I was homeless for a little while. Until I found a more permanent situation after I graduated high school, crashing on friends' couches and living in their guest rooms for a few weeks here and there. Originally, I wanted to go to college, but unfortunately, I had to earn a living to eat and pay rent and stuff. I ended up doing fairly well. I went from retail work to sales management to at work. I now make six figures as a senior systems administrator for a large HR nonprofit. I got married, had a son, and was married for 25 years until my wife passed away just last year from sarcoidosis. During that time, I have published two novels, have a collection of short stories, and am the president of a large anime company that has a large convention here every year. I still suffer a lot from PTSD from my childhood, mostly due to my father's abuse. But I manage. I see a therapist and I take some psychotropic medication from time to time to deal with depression. Last I heard, my father was still alive. He got remarried shortly after my mother's death, and they moved out to California somewhere. My father and his wife are very wealthy, living off of our tax dollars in the defense industry, while his wife has a large inheritance from an old money family. I have probably seen him about five times since I was forced to leave the house in 1987. He's seen his only grandchild three times. But he does not seem to be interested at all in any sort of communication. He is very happy with the money that he makes and the lifestyle that he leads. And he never wanted to have children, so. I guess it worked out for him. I did okay. Combination of skill mixed with luck. Because luck favors the prepared. It could have very easily gone the other way. And although I suffer from depression, I still feel blessed most of the time by the opportunities that I have had through my networking, friendship, and hard work. J and 9th A581 not by my parents, but by my grandmother. My parents were divorced when I was a kid. When I was 18, I moved across the country with my mom. Two weeks later, my dad was killed in an accident. I had a really hard time dealing with it while being so far away, so a few months later I moved back. My grandparents took me in, and I lived in their basement with my cat. I had a good full-time job, paid my bills, and had a small amount of money left over for savings. I was making a fair amount for a 19-year-old kid but I had a car payment, insurance, gas, cell phone, food, etc. That ate up most of it. There was no chance of me earning enough any time soon to get my own place. I usually worked closing shifts at work, 2 10 30 at night. I would leave in the afternoon, when no one was home, with my lunch in a plastic grocery bag, and some other things magazines, crocheting, game boy, etc. In another bag, sometimes a canvas tote, sometimes another plastic bag from somewhere like Target. I'd bring home the empty Tupperware and my personal stuff at night, greeting my grandparents, who always saw me walk in, then going downstairs to my room. This went on for about eight months. One morning before work, I sorted my laundry into piles on the floor colors and lights, so I could toss it in the wash when I got home. This was in my own room, mind you. Then I went to work. I came home to a letter from my grandmother, saying I was extremely disrespectful, leaving crap. All over my floor literally the only thing on the floor was the laundry and buying things every single day. She thought I was buying things when I would bring home the bags and I would either have to start paying $600 per month to live there or leave. There was absolutely no way I could pay that much money. Even if I totally stopped eating, I did not have enough expendable income after my bills to afford that. So I left about three days later, after unsuccessful attempts to change my grandmother's mind. A few months later, I found out my grandfather had a heart attack. He was elderly, had been a lifelong alcoholic, though sober for about 15 years at that point, and had numerous other health problems. My grandmother blamed the heart attack solely on the stress I caused. My mother tried very hard to talk her out of this, but it wasn't happening. It's been almost 15 years, and I've seen my grandmother exactly once, and she made it very clear she had no interest in speaking to me. She does still speak to my mother, but they do not speak of me since my grandmother said, she thought my mother was a horrible mother who did a terrible job raising me. What's funny about that is that my mother was the teenage smoker drinker who got pregnant as an unmarried 18-year-old. I was the straight-edged child who got good grades and never, ever got in trouble. My grandmother doesn't ask about me, and my mother doesn't offer any information. My grandmother thinks I am still married, living outside of Boston. Although I left Boston for California almost three years ago when I left my husband, and I now live in Arizona and have a new boyfriend. I was always very close to my grandmother, and it actually makes me quite sad that she shut me out. But at the same time, this is something she did, not me, and I try to remember that I'm not responsible for her craziness. Deleted. I grew up poor as dirt in northwest Indiana, specifically the SHTTY part of Hammond. 
Growing up was pretty f up. Dad died when I was super young, and we lost our house. I spent the next eight or nine years in a moldy basement in a house infested by vermin and insects. After multiple house fires, there were more moldy basement dwellings. I spent most of this time either being ignored or shunned by my family for the most part, bullied or abused by my arsy hole, or the professional failure of a cousin, or otherwise made to feel as if I just wasn't welcome. I moved out around 19 and kicked it with my uncle for a few months before I got out on my own. Kicked arse at it and scalped to survive. I pulled it off with hard work. I talked to my mother off and on during this time. We mostly fought over the phone. I was always the one to call. She would never bother to call me. Her number changed like clockwork because she could never pay the bill. Alcoholism always came first. She was seemingly really upset that I left. But it quickly became apparent that she was only upset because my continued existence in her household resulted in additional support from the government or on her tax return when she claimed me. The rest of my family was all too eager to forget I ever existed, it seems, because they never bothered trying to contact me. One day, we simply stopped talking altogether. I changed my phone number to deal with some telemarketing harassment I was dealing with, and I thought briefly of letting them know I had done so, but I thought better of it. They didn't seem to mind. My uncle asked if I wanted to let them know my number, and I declined. Not like they bothered reaching out anyways all these years. I'm doing really well in life these days. I would have liked to think they cared or would be proud of me. But I know I'm just kidding myself with that line of thinking. My uncle is the only family I have in my book. We don't really talk much and are pretty distant. But I know he's proud of me and cares. Kabi Kikitsune. I'm a writer in my spare time. Mostly short stories, a couple novels self-published, and one children's book series also self-published. I was disowned by my family during a libel copyright lawsuit against a rather well-known adultery story site. The suit centered around the fact that a writer in Arizona had somehow, perhaps by pure coincidence, written a series of incest stories that featured characters who had both my mother's and my name's. I contacted the author in regards to this, asking for at the very least a disclaimer that the names were not in any regard representative of people living or dead, or for the stories to be edited and the names removed. The author told me to go pound sand among other things. This prompted me to turn to the website, upon which I filed a number of claims with them. The first was a simple request for them to force the change on the author, which was refused. I then contacted a lawyer who noted that, as a published author who uses himself in a number of his own short stories, my name was effectively copyrighted. Furthermore, this would constitute libel on the part of the website and author for refusing to modify or remove the offending material. A certified cease and desist letter was sent to them, with the notation that I would seek suit against them and damages if they either failed to respond in a timely manner. I believe I gave them a month, or if the letter returned unsigned. On day 29, they finally responded, sending a long ranting letter that said in part that they cared more about free speech than copyright, and added that the story must be true if I was protesting as much as I was. Furthermore, they refused to divulge the actual address or location of the author in question, preventing me from suing them as well. Somewhere in the middle of all this, the stories were submitted by the site to Google and a few other sites to come up as a specific search result for when my name was searched. We found this out in court. This was likely done in retribution for my threat to sue or to scare me into backing down. While they did not say it in so many words, they did hint in later correspondence that if I were to dismiss the case, then they'd make the search result thing go away. Around this time, while searching for the title of one of my children's books, due to his not knowing my home phone at the time, he searched for my name. Guess what popped up at the top of the search results? Well, SHT went downhill from there. Everyone in the family simply cut ties with me, leaving me all alone. It didn't help that the few I had contact with wouldn't listen to my explanations. To make matters worse, letters from family started to come to a publisher who was looking at doing a release of my children's book series. I don't know what those letters said, but I can guess. The company cut all ties with me as well, and I've not been able to have a book published since. I do still write, but the fat load of good it does me. As to the case, we filed in district court in 2010. By 2011, as the trial was just about to start, the website either had a change of heart or found a lawyer who didn't have their head up their arse. They contacted us my lawyer and I and agreed to remove the stories completely, post an apology on the front page of their website, change the rules in regards to reporting copyrighted materials or real names used without permission, and remove the search results that they had submitted. They also agreed to pay all my legal fees, plus court costs 
and a small sum to me for the trouble they'd cost. As for the family, well, let's put it this way. I didn't find out that my uncle, who lived in the same town as me, had been killed in an accident until a good friend of mine told me about it. Three weeks later, most recently, when my cousin who was like a brother to me, and we grew up together passed away last November. I did not find out about it until July of this year, when, out of the blue, I decided to Google the bar he owned and noted that a previous owner had passed away. So I Googled his name and found his obituary. So, where am I now? I work for the Dodd, though, in all honesty, I'm trying to get out of it. While the pay is good, the hours are simply murder. In Ormausbeck. I don't expect anyone to read this, but in case you do, I warn you that it's a long story. When I was a kid, my mom and dad got divorced because they argued all the time. My dad got married to a friend of our neighbor at the time and moved away. They had two daughters. Me, my mom, and my brother moved to a small apartment. I still got to see my dad and his family for a couple of years, as I slept over at their house each weekend, until the visits just stopped out of nowhere when I was eight. My mom claimed my dad was busy working overseas in New York at the time. Some time after I turned 15, she got in contact with him, and after meeting up again, we arranged for the weekly sleepovers to continue. This proved a bit stressful for me as dad and his wife were constantly arguing, and my sisters, while great, are a bit hyperactive. My mom noticed at the time that every time I slept over, I felt sick afterwards, so she changed it to one sleepover every two weeks. In a book, this would be called foreshadowing. Around that same time, my mom got a boyfriend, and we moved in with him my brother was already out of the house by then. In a nutshell, they started arguing a lot, and we moved back to our small apartment. Then they reconciled, and we moved back in with him. Then they started arguing a lot again. I remember the nights where I turned up the volume on my computer, so I could pretend nothing was wrong. Fun times. Anyhow. One day, I was visiting a market with my dad, when my mom called me to tell me we were homeless. Her boyfriend was throwing us out, and our old apartment was now leased out to someone else, so we had no place to stay anymore. I told the story to my dad in tears, and he offered for me to stay at his place as long as necessary, which I took him up on. I got my clothes and laptop that night, and I moved in with them. It was hell for me. I was depressed. The only ones bothering to cheer me up were my sisters. My dad and his wife were constantly arguing. And I had nothing to do and nowhere to go as my dad didn't let me go to school as it was in another city. And he claimed public transport was too expensive. I browsed the internet on my laptop all day, wallowing in my own depression and body odor. That was literally all I did for. Two weeks, I believe. When you do nothing but browse feel threads on slash b slash. The days start blurring together quickly. At one point, my dad asked me to come downstairs, where the whole family was waiting, and told me he would prefer I start living with him permanently. I didn't even answer him. One afternoon, my mom called the house and asked me how I was doing. Pretty crappy, of course, but I only told her a few things about how dad and his wife were constantly yelling and some other stuff. I hung up and went downstairs to get dinner. I can remember that evening quite well. We were having spaghetti, and my youngest sister was complaining about how she didn't like the sauce. How can you not love spaghetti sauce? I thought. I would have to hit her in the head later. Then the phone rang again. My heart skipped a beat. My dad answered it. It was my mom. Just like I thought. He didn't seem pleased with what she said. Hung up. I told the rest of the family that she said they were constantly arguing. I didn't believe I would say such things. Didn't answer. I wouldn't be able to. Anyhow, because dad and his wife got into another argument. About whether they argue a lot. I would have laughed at the irony, but I was scared SHT less at the time. The next morning, when dad was at work and my sisters were at school, his wife burst in and told me I was going to live with my mom again. I would have been ecstatic if it weren't for the fact that she seemed incredibly eager to push me out the door, as she got my stuff and pushed it into my suitcase as fast as humanly possible without even explaining anything, walked me to the subway, and then F Ed right off. At the end of the subway's line, I got to see my mom and aunt. Mom managed to get an even smaller apartment. But the apartment wasn't quite done. So I had to move in with my older half-sister for a while. I didn't mind. I was very happy just to see her again. And I was able to go to school once more, too. I was, and still am, curious why my dad's wife just pushed me out of nowhere. My older half-sister once had a talk with me about it. Apparently, my mom had a talk with my dad's wife over the phone. Something has to do with an incident in my youth that I can't remember. There's probably a lot I don't know about. Anyhow, ever since, 
My dad has not replied to anything we sent his way. Not even some legal business we needed his signature for. Well, without the exception of one email in which I accused him of ignoring me. I got one email where he claimed he wasn't ignoring me. Just very busy with work. And then he went right back to ignoring me. I can't say for sure why. Maybe because I didn't want to live with him permanently. Maybe because I just left right out of nowhere. Who knows? I can't say I miss him. I do really miss my sisters. I haven't seen them in person for years. I talk with my oldest younger sister on WhatsApp sometimes, though. She seems to be growing up just fine, contrary to what I expected with parents like hers. It stinks that we have to be stealthy about it. She's kind of afraid of what'll happen if her parents find out. TLDR. My dad's a D-bag. Thank you for watching the video. If you are interested in listening to these kinds of stories, we've got more in store for you. Simply subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and share it with your friends.